Um, well, first of all, thank you very much to um, Lars and Francisca and Sebastian and everybody who's worked so hard to make this possible. I know how much work these events are. And thank you all to everyone who's actually turned up. Um, it's a very nice evening. It's beautiful weather out there. I'm sure there's really good wine to be drunk. But um, So thank you for, for being here. Um, Though so we did just decide, if you're not here, you don't get any dinner. So tell your friends who aren't here that what they're missing. Um, now, some of you, I know some of you, the, particularly the Dutch contingent, um, uh, and they will know, and you will all soon find out, that I am really not a linguist. Um, however, for the last five years, I have been sitting in the Meertens Institute building, um, and the Meertens Institute is full of linguists. Um, and every now and then, one of them would come along and ask me to say something in my very best Dutch, um, because he wanted to know how English people said things in Dutch. And uh, so if at some future point you hear a Dutch linguist talking about you know, English speakers' pronunciation of Dutch, I am probably the corpus. Um, I think that that's my kind of closest relationship to, to linguists. Though, of course, um, as Lars has already said, um, I have been very involved in various digital humanities activities in the Netherlands over the last kind of five to ten years. And, of course, linguists are very, very present in that. But my own kind of background is more in the history, philosophy, and sociology of science and technology. Um, and I'm very, very interested in how people use technologies, particularly digital technologies, um, to create knowledge, to make sense of the world. And for those of you who really just thought you'd come and see what this was like and then decide to go and have a drink, um, the short version of my talk, um, you can leave after this, is um, that technologies, including software, are not neutral because they are designed, made, and used by people. And linguists are people too. Um, and they are making, you are making, increasing use of digital technologies in your research. So, and I'll give some examples of this. That's basically what I'm going to do. Um, people who are making technologies um, are, you know, sometimes consciously, sometimes less consciously, on the basis of various kind of political, economic, epistemic kind of interests, are making decisions about what kinds of technologies we want. Now, for some of you who may have looked at the abstract that's online, I um, started by saying, you know, have you ever wondered why the Paris metro tunnels are so narrow? Um, this is what people in my field like to do and like to worry about. Um, and there is a reason. Um, probably the, Fre the French people might know, the French people who are here. Um, but at the end of the 19th century, when the kind of radical left Parisian city council wanted to begin the construction of a metro, um, they wanted it to remain in public ownership. Because at that time, and as many railway systems, railways were often owned by different private companies. So what they wanted to find a way of excluding the private railway companies, not just in the short term, which they could, could probably control, but also in the longer term, in the case that a kind of more right-wing city council was elected. So their first idea was to use narrower tracks for the metro, um, different from those that were used for overground trains. But the military uh, persuaded them that this would be a threat to national security. That always kind of trumps any kind of discussions around uh, designs of technologies. So instead, what the city council decided was to keep the track width the same, but to reduce the width of the coaches themselves so that they could make the tunnels too narrow for conventional railway uh, coaches. So... As the kind of metro expanded, the possibility for the railway companies to take it over were kind of diminished because it would have just cost them too much to then adjust their kind of coaches to fit into these narrow little tunnels. So this kind of end of the 19th century um, Paris Council didn't simply choose to develop the metro as a public transport system, um, but they, they wanted to kind of keep it a public transport system. And it wasn't that the widths of the track or the widths of the coaches or the tunnels were necessitated by, you know, the knowledge of how to build a railway of that time. It was um, a very conscious choice within the kind of technical limits of the time, um, very conscious choice to set, quite literally, in stone and concrete and metal, um, the, their commitment to public ownership of mass transport. So... 
that's a nice example, hmm? I think. The other example I asked you to kind of consider in the little abstract I sent was park benches. Now, I would like to reassure you that no homeless people were exploited. That's actually my husband. Um, and um, we went out one evening to take photographs of park benches, as you do. I have a really exciting life. Um, and um, actually, I've just noticed outside here you have nice uh, wooden park benches. Um, but here you can, on the side closest to me, on this one, um, Increasingly, in public places, you see them with armrests, but this first one has actually been vandalized already. You know, never underestimate user agency. Um, and, but basically, city councils now aren't necessarily all nice uh, left-wing kind of ones. They put these there to stop homeless people lying down on them. Um, and whereas you see in the old days with a nice bench without armrests, homeless people could lie down on them. And in that particular park then, or it's actually, it's along the Amstel for those of you from Amsterdam, um, there are lights. Now I've never been able to establish, is this because the city council in Amsterdam wants homeless people to be able to read easily or whether it doesn't want them to sleep there. Um, it's probably, could be one or the other. So again, very kind of mundane, everyday bit of the kind of built environment where kind of choices are being made about who should be using them, how people should be using them, um, for what kinds of purposes. Another example that I quite like um, is, I don't know if you can see this, this is the Phillips Lady Shave. Um, now, nice smooth legs, safe and easy shaving. Phillips, you know, engineers spent a lot of time kind of designing both the, the box, well, somebody else probably designed the box, um, but designing the lady shave, the razor itself, um, so that it would be smooth and pink um, and not have any screws because we all know women don't like fiddly little screws and things like that. So they had all sorts of assumptions about who was going to use this and under what conditions and what they thought about technology, and they kind of built that into the razor. So in kind of my world, we sometimes talk about technologies being black boxed, kind of, you know, um, folded up so that you can't get into them anymore. This, I like to think, has been pink boxed, um, a different kind of thing. Again, I was talking to somebody during one of the breaks. Um, you know, those of us who are old enough, when we had kind of the first home computers back in the kind of early 80s, they were anything but black boxed. Um, you know, you kind of had to take the motherboard out and hold it together with a paper clip and stand on the roof and things like that to get it to work. We really understood the inner workings of our computers. Now, if you try to get into your iPad, probably your warranty goes and Apple comes out and shoots you. But um, so kind of digital technologies have been increasingly black boxed. So, okay, these are a few examples from everyday lives. Once you start to think about this, you'll see this everywhere, how technologies are designed with particular purposes um, and how those can maybe be changed or subverted in different ways. But what does this mean for linguists, you might be wondering? That's what it means for linguists. Um, so, A couple of weeks ago, um, this came around on Twitter. I don't know if some of you might have seen this. Um, Mercedes announced that it's level four and five autonomous cars. When given the choice, um, we're going to save drivers. Um, that the software was being designed so that if the car had a choice of hitting a brick wall or a bus stop with five children, um, if there was a risk to the driver, it'll go for the kids. Um, so now I think this is probably going to end up being tested in the courts. Um, I don't think you have to watch out for Mercedes quite yet. But um, again, it kind of reflects a very kind of conscious choice on the part of the designers of the software in the Mercedes new autonomous car about who is more important, the driver who's probably paid for it or some random pedestrian um, who hasn't. So, you can see where I'm going with this. Algorithms, just like park benches, are made by people. I'm kind of going to work you up to um, linguistics. There was another report um, earlier this year. I don't know how well you can read that. I don't, did anyone else kind of see this? 20%, um, they reckon, of um, published uh, genetics research has a mistake because of the tendency of Excel to turn some gene names into dates. Um, 
So septin-21, you can see where they might go with that. And then membrane-assisted ring finger, open bracket, C3, HC4, close bracket, one comma, E3, ubiquitin, ubiquitin protein, which for ease of speaking, linguists refer to as March 1. Um, again, if uh, an Excel sheet sees that in a cell, it turns those into dates. Now you'd think they'd have noticed by now. Um, so what these um, people did, the, file, the picture up there, was they looked at all of the supplementary files to published papers in genetics for the last 10 years. This problem had already been identified in 2004. Um, Microsoft obviously didn't do anything about it, but you'd think geneticists might have paid some attention. But anyway, these researchers looked at a set of papers from uh, for the 2005 to 2015 um, and found that 20% of them had this mistake still. Um, these supplementary files, these are the ones that kind of get published and get reused. So, I mean, this isn't what we're going to talk about today, but I think for those of us who also sometimes think about open data, be careful what you wish for. Um, you know, these supplementary files then kind of enter the kind of public scientific record and get used and reused by genetics researchers. Hopefully this will stimulate a few more geneticists to, to pay attention. But it's not only geneticists. There were also reports um, amongst uh, what was it, the MFRI, the no FMRI, functional, you know, the people who stick people in um, uh, resin, you know, to take X-rays of brains or pictures of brains. Um, and uh, I'm not a neuroscientist either. Um, so it's been they've been been studies in the past uh, looking at brain activity, and what these people wanted to do. Um, was to see, you know, are there kind of problems here? And they did, I think, a very good thing. They looked at three different kind of software packages that looked at the results from um, different kinds of brain studies. Um, and what they found was that they had different algorithms for clustering um, voxels that measure activity in the brain. Um, and they found that in 70% of the cases, they were assigning activity where there was no activity. Now, if this is probably better than the other way around, I feel. Um, you know, that if they were, otherwise, they'd be pulling a lot of plugs thinking we were dead. But um, So what they kind of conclude is, A, that there's a bit of a problem here, and people should be a lot more careful. Um, and they say at the end, you know, we could go back and check all the kind of previously studied uh, uh, all the previous studies and papers, but in some cases the data isn't there, it isn't connected in a kind of good open way, and of course it's not the most glamorous bit of research. Um, you know, some people really like going around and checking other people's work and looking for mistakes, you know, it has a certain kind of schadenfreude uh, pleasure about it, um, but it's unlikely to get published, it's unlikely to get rewarded in the current academic system, so people tend not to do it so much. So all this stuff stays there in the kind of scientific record. Now, I mean, I think, uh, I don't want to particularly defend social psychologists, I think some of their problems they brought on themselves, but these kinds of problems are not unique to social psychologists, um, of replication, lousy data, lots of mistakes, kind of getting through and into the, the published record. Now, luckily, in linguistics, as far as I know, nobody dies as a result of mistakes that, you know, made by Mercedes or uh, brain researchers. Now, I'm sure you're all very sophisticated linguists, um, so you all know the problems of Google Books and Ngram. Um, probably doesn't stop some of us from using it sometime. Um, Whereas actually, Google Books is really a library. Um, you know, there's one copy of each. It's a, it's a lexicon, it's not a corpus. Um, so you really can't say anything particularly meaningful about cultural kind of trends or cultural popularity of particular kinds of words or phrases just by looking at how frequently they appear in Google Books. So for example, for the kind of nerds among you, um, or the teenage boys, um, Frodo, uh, major hobbit um, in Lord of the Rings, you know, he spikes a bit in the mid-50s, but it's, a, it's not a typical English word, so it doesn't come back very much. This, you know, if you relied on Google Books, you would drastically underestimate the importance and popularity of Frodo in the Lord of the Rings. Um, 
And now, I think particularly as more and more university libraries are being included in Google Books, and, and people have written about this, um, it's, Google Books is becoming less and less useful for understanding kind of cultural and linguistic change because academics, as we all know, kind of use very particular kinds of language. So it's um, no longer kind of, or less useful than it ever was um, for understanding culturenomics, as people called it. There was another item in the news uh, not so long ago where someone had been looking at, you know, teaching Google News with machine learning techniques, and they were trying to teach it to do analogous thinking, which, you know, is a fantastically challenging problem. And um, one of the things they were interested in was gender and gender biases in language. We all know that all languages have gender biases. Um, and one of the things that it came out with, looking through lots and lots of Google News stories, so not kind of ancient historical texts from the 1950s, but kind of relatively recent stuff in the news. Um, and Google, after it had been you know, trained for a while on this corpus, was asked, OK, man is to programmer as woman is to. And it came up with homemaker. And I thought, you know, what century does Google News think we're living in? Um, well, yeah, the world isn't always how I would like it to be. Um, so. But this, I think, is particularly problematic because it's not only reflecting bias that's out there. Because of the way Google works, it could potentially amplify bias in the future because people will use this as a kind of some kind of indicator of what normal is. And you can imagine some poor 13-year-old girl thinking, oh, well, I wonder, you know, I'd like to be a computer programmer when I grow up and kind of types it in and gets increased, you know, very gendered notions of what computer programmers look like and what the options for her are. So then, I'm getting a bit more complicated now. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to see this terribly well. Um, this is something I believe is very close to the hearts of ling some linguists. Topic modeling. Um, we could do. A, I, I can't actually see you, so I could ask you, you know, how many of you have ever topic modeled? If that's the verb. Quite a few of you, okay, as far as I can tell. Um, as you then probably know, um, topic modeling comes out of natural language programming and computer science using a probabilistic algorithm um, and searches for you know, a specified number of topics indicated by sets of words that have been extracted from the text being studied. And the output allows the, the researcher to kind of ins look at the documents in terms of, you know, do their t those topics appear in that document and the, um, how the kind of relative size of each word in each of the topics, which can be incredibly useful for understanding large collections of texts. And this is what it's largely used for, uh, so-called distant reading, where you can have lots and lots of texts and try and identify what are the major topics, themes that are coming out of it. But there are, there are alternatives. There's another older technique um, called co-word analysis, which dates back already to the 1960s and the so-called linguistic turn in the philosophy of science associated with people including Kuhn, Quine, Hesse, who argued that the networks of co-occurrences and co-absences of words um, can be used, you know, if you kind of try and map this in some way, you can use this to understand the evolution of the sciences. So these kind of people, you know, could try and trace, you know, when did bioinformatics start to become a kind of thing, um, or also, also at a much more detailed level. Um, and people have been using computers to um, make co-word maps since the 1980s, and in scientometrics, and in some philosophy of science, people have been doing this for a long time. And there are now many alternative programs for doing this. But this article that I mentioned here, um, that's uh, about to be published in the Journal of the Association of uh, Information Science and Technology by Lute Leidesdorf and um, Nerichus. I've forgotten Nerichus' first name. It's very bad. Uh, Adina Nerichus. Um, what they decided to do, because they thought they'd already done some work around comparing different software and different visualizations for co-word analysis, these are two scientometricians, they thought, okay, let's compare co-word analysis with topic modeling. That'll be kind of interesting. And I think it is a kind of interesting and important thing to try and do. 
So that's what they did up there. Um, now, what you can't see is the co-word analysis is the one at the top, and there are different, I can see this one better, different kind of clusters um, where the kind of words kind of co-occur and the relative distance kind of tells you how far apart they are. And okay, I'm not going to go into the technicalities of this. So then what they did with the same text, so they did this in a kind of stepwise function. First of all, they just used a single text, which... They say, and I know, that that's not, what you're, that's not what you're supposed to do with topic modeling. You're supposed to use really, really big texts. But as a kind of experiment to start with a single text, which they could read and then also kind of judge, does either of these make much sense and, and things like that. So they started with a single text. Um, and uh, then they found out um, what you can see in the, the bottom, which is the topic map, there are a lot of words that are in white. Those never appeared in the topic models, um, whereas they had appeared in the co-word analysis, which would already give you some pause for thought and think, hmm, what's kind of going on here? Um, and what they looked at was the Leiden Manifesto. I don't know if any of you have read this. It was published in Nature um, about a year ago um, by colleagues at uh, the University of Leiden about... Um, how careful one had to be with um, metrics for measuring academic performance. Um, they thought it was a document that was close to all of our hearts. Um, anyway, the words that were left out included academic, publication, and performance, all kind of key <laughs> to the argument in the Leiden Manifesto. So they were kind of a little worried about this. They then did it with a set of about 700 documents, um, also related to um, uh, um, evaluating university performance and university rankings and things like that. And again, um, certain topics never appeared in the topic modeling that had appeared in the co-word analysis, including um, university ranking um, and publication, which, again, you know, were words that you might a priori have good reason to believe were rather important for the content of what was going on. So, I mean, they admit, Leidersdorf and Nerchus, that actually, you know, topic modeling is for really big corpora, and they don't really know what, how it works with really big corpora, but that their results should give people using topic modeling some pause for thought and um, thinking about it. Because, of course, you know, if you're presented with, you know, a list of topic models and a bunch of words, you know, I'm sure if any of us presented with a list of 10 words could come up with a completely plausible story about the kind of relationship between those sorts of words. Words are very flexible. We're all very kind of creative. Um, this could be quite easily done. So the problem is, as you say, you know, when you've got a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. Um, so one of the things, you know, one of my other kind of conclusions from today is really that um, we should all get out more. Um, we should experiment. Um, we should experiment with the methods and the tools that have been developed in kind of related cognate disciplines, um, see how they work, whether they work. And also, I think more importantly, the tools that we are kind of grew up with, we really know how well they work, we think, and we know, you know, we can easily use them, and we think, okay, we can just apply this to something else. Maybe ask yourself, hmm, um, you know, is this hammer really the most appropriate tool for this particular job? So let's say in kind of my world, um, one of the kind of basic assumptions is really that knowledge is always kind of inscribed in and by the instruments that are available to us. You know, tele uh, the availability of a telescope, however rudimentary it was, made a difference not only to Galileo, but also for the acceptance of his heretical ideas. And, you know, technologies are amazing. You know, it's hard to top the uh, Large Hadron Collider for amazing wow kind of technology factor. That's what that picture is. Um, um, but they are also always a product of their time and their place, um, and they always kind of bear traces of who made them, for what purposes, if you kind of look for that sort of thing. So what should be done? 
And here I think we can learn a lot from our kind of colleagues in history and archiving. Are there any historians in the room? Hmm? Apart from Ian Gregory. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> um, a few, not so many. Now, historians have all, you know, are trained to think about source criticism, to think about, you know, because um, we also, well, historians know, lots of other people know, you know, books, texts, knowledge is kind of created by particular people at particular times. You always have to try and understand the context in which something is produced. So, you know, apparently historians spend, you know, much of their training kind of asking questions, you know, who wrote this? Um, what did they have access to when they wrote this? How might that have influenced what they were doing? Were there other versions? Is this the final version or is this version number 4.3 out of 10? Um, so they, um, I think we can learn from that, first of all, to think about corpus and data set kind of criticism, and I think the kind of parallels are, are very kind of easy to make, and I know that lots and lots of people, um, uh, certainly, you know, certainly in the humanities, do kind of make that. They kind of think, okay, I've got this data set. Where did it come from? What's the provenance? Um, uh, you know, what's happened to the metadata? Is the metadata complete? Because um, we all know, you know, with old paper archives, sometimes the metadata got separated from the original sources. That sometimes happens with digital things as well. Um, so I think we have a lot to learn from our colleagues in the kind of archival world, the historical world, particularly you know, how you can apply what they kind of think about with sources and archives to data. But I think what I'd like to suggest is that we make the next step and think about tool criticism. Um, and this is also, I mean, this isn't just me saying this, there are lots of other people saying this, and about 18 months ago we had a workshop in Amsterdam where um, humanities scholars were invited to bring along a kind of tool or a data set that they were kind of struggling with, and um, we kind of had these as sort of use cases, or, and it was a kind of experimental workshop kind of session to think about, okay, what are the limits of this tool? When would it be good to use it, and when would it be not so um, good to use it? To ask the same kinds of questions that you would ask of historical texts, to think, you know, who were the developers? Um, were they working for Microsoft at the time? Did that have a kind of influence or consequences for what kind of tools they were developing? Um, is there any documentation available? I'm sure we all have experience of wonderful, wonderful tools and, you know, find the documentation um, far, far away. Um, wasn't ever made or has been kind of separated from the, from the software. Um, again, are there different versions? What are the differences? What are the consequences of those kinds of differences? Are there similar tools that could do something kind of related? And have you kind of checked your favorite tool against those similar kinds of tools? So that's kind of what I think we all need to be doing. I know it means then a lot more work for everybody because um, to kind of do all of this kind of seriously, and I'm sure many of you are already doing these kinds of things, um, but sometimes it isn't always visible in the kind of final products and the published work because of constraints and um, all sorts of reasons. Um, now, what I want to... I'm actually doing really well for time. Um, end with, again, um, in this kind of world of kind of history, philosophy, sociology of science and technology, one of our kind of favorite sayings is things could have been otherwise. Um, and this field is full and full, you know, actually too many, but that's a different problem, of case studies of science and technology that kind of demonstrates, well, you know, people made particular choices at particular times that were actually nothing to do with the technological or scientific limits. They were a lot to do with particular um, business choices or social choices. And one of the famous examples isn't about meerkats, sadly, but it is about bicycles. Um, so, you know, one of the, you know, you recognize this penny farthing version of a bicycle where the front wheel is much, much bigger than the back wheel. This is quite unusual now. Most bicycles, um, the wheels are of equal size. This didn't happen because just overnight people thought, oh, that's a better idea. Um, it was, you know, there's been a lot of work to demonstrate, you know, how did that happen and the difference between French bicycle makers and English bicycle makers. I'm not going to go into those details, but 
Um, but it's from that kind of work where people say, you know, we could have all been riding around on bicycles that looked like this. Um, could have been more fun. Um, they could have been otherwise. Yeah. But that also means, okay, they could have been otherwise in the past, but that also means they could be otherwise in the future, um, which means that we still have choices to make and things to do and other ways to organize things. So if we're not happy with our co-word uh, software or our topic modeling software or the visualization software that produces you know, weird pictures that are more or less easy to understand, you could do something about it. You could try something else and um, that might kind of be different. So we can make a difference. We can make better park benches, better bicycles, and better software. Thank you. So thank you very much for a thought-provoking and interesting presentation. There is time for... There is some time for questions still. You've had a long day. Are there questions? Yes. <clears throat> Actually, during the... Yeah, I, I am me. Um, <laughs> Gondra Altesmet, chair of the NCF. Okay. Um, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, actually, um, a little story during the... Um, um, defense of my doctoral dissertation, I was asked, asked the question, does this program really work the, w the way you describe it in your dissertation? And this is a little bit similar to the question you're addressing. Um, and uh, so I had to say that, I had to admit I had not to run a formal proof. Of course, this question was asked by somebody who had studied informatics and he, who had worked on formal proofs of programs. And it is actually possible to, you know, in a mathematically formal way, uh, describe that the program does what, what, what we um, claim it does. Um, but I guess, on the one hand, uh, this, is, this is in theory possible, but on the other hand, maybe it wouldn't even satisfy you. Because even, we, I even if we prove that a program does what we claim, I mean, it doesn't, um, it doesn't really add much, I think, to, to what you are saying. Yeah, I mean, I think there are different levels. I mean, that, that slide that just had the three words on it about bias, mistakes, and error. Um, what I was sort of suggesting in that kind of subliminally, and clearly it sort of worked, um, was that there are different kinds of mistakes, error, uncertainty. And um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. A formal proof by itself, okay, it's important and somebody's got to do it and um, it would be nice to know that, you know, there isn't a rounding error mistake in your software, for example, which sometimes happens as well. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is something, I think, um, a bit more, I mean, subtle, I don't want to claim that, but um, that I just think we need to be thinking a bit more about the tools we're using and the limits, not only to what they can say, but also what we can claim. And I mean, I personally don't have a problem with um, that. I mean, it makes a difference, I think, what kind of field you're working in. But the fact that, you know, it's incredibly difficult and almost meaningless to talk about replication in history doesn't bother me very much. Um, as you get more data, different sources of different kind, you know, we think about the Holocaust differently than people in the 1960s. That happens. Interpretations change. I can live with that. But I think we need to be kind of reflexive about that and think about, okay, what data do we have? What are the limits, as a good historian would? And now, on top of that, just to make life more difficult, what are the tools we have? What are the search engines? What are they all doing to what material we've got and how we analyze it and what conclusions we can make? So, I mean, I think formally you could call that error. I prefer uncertainty. Um, Sally, Arjan uh, Klaria. Um, Sally, I have a question. Uh, don't you give too much value to the tools? I mean, if you compare that to the bicycle, you can say, well, in the 1910s or when the bicycle started to come, um, you can say, well, from Amsterdam to Utrecht, it was 45 minutes by bicycle. But then the bicycle changed, and now it's 30 minutes. And in the future, the bicycle will change again, and it will be 25 minutes, something like that. That is the same, according to me, with all the tools we are using. We are using the tools not to predict an, uh, the truth, but it is an instrument to help us, humanity scholars, to figure out if something is happening. So, of course, tools will change, but 
I guess that the tools, you, you must use the tools to figure out that something is happening, and then you, as a human scholar, are going to look to the, to the phenomena and try to explain them. And it is not that the tools are predicting the truth, that you say, well, the, the tool is telling me this, and so that is the truth. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think there are two kind of elements to that. I mean, one um, is the um, kind of the analogy, okay, some things that the current tools do is they just help us do the same thing but faster, you know, to get to Utrecht more quickly. And that's fine and that's okay. It's kind of efficient and helpful. But I think there is something more, because I think sometimes, you know, I have seen and heard humanities scholars think that these are truth machines. Um, and that's what I'm trying to warn against, that because they're black boxed, because we don't understand how the algorithms work, we push a few kind of um, keys, and uh, if it's a, the nicer the interface, kind of the worse in some ways. Oh, that's a terrible thing to say probably to you people, but, um, but you think, okay, this is easy, this is works, it's complete, it's going to give me access to things I didn't have access to before. And I think, I think that's misleading, because I think sometimes... You know, you're actually missing a lot of things. It's giving you f false positives, false negatives. I mean, I don't necessarily want to kind of wholesale take over that kind of language. But I think we can learn from our colleagues in the natural sciences about how to think about error and mistakes and experimentation and comparison. So that's what I'm kind of pleading for, is more experimentation and maybe a bit more kind of carefulness about what we're claiming. And I think, you know, lots of humanities scholars do that all the time, but not everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to endorse very much... Uh, oh, sorry, I'm Sebastian Drude, uh, General Coordinator of Clarin Eric <laughs> Utrecht. Um, I, I, I wanted to contest what, what, what Arian said, and I wanted very much to endorse what you say. And there are so many examples which pop up into my mind when I, when I hear. So, so from my time as linguistic field worker, you, you, you want to have text with interlinear glossings. And Toolbox does this, and some other tools do, uh, do that, Flex now. And, and they force you to use a certain linguistic theory, an item and arrangement theory or an item and process theory, but not a word and paradigm theory. So there are many good linguistic theories around, but the tools that we have, they are they, they use an underlying conception of how languages works. And we do the same thing if we produce tree banks or if we have word nets. So there are all theoretically uh, underlying things built in which model the outcomes. So if a student doesn't study linguistic theories and compares them but only knows of one linguistic theory or even doesn't know nothing but only studies digital humanities and uses a tree parser or a part of speech tagger, so what are those part of speeches and what are those syntactic structures and which linguistic theory is applied there and they have no cue. So it is very much biased to how we look at language and, and we really run into the risk that we only know of certain linguistic theories and there might be others which perhaps are more adequate for other things to do, but we don't know about them because they are not built in, in, into our tools. I hope I, I grasp what you were trying to, to say. Great. This was not a question. Much so. better example. <laughs> Thank you. Because I think that's another really important kind of element which I didn't really touch on is the ways in, I mean, it sort of did with the CERN example, but the ways in which tools also reflect epistemic choices um, and, ep and particular kinds of theoretical ideas. And I think that's also really, really important. Um, so thank you. Hmm? So uh, I think we need to wrap up now in order to prepare for the dinner. And also there is one final little thing that will happen. So please don't rise and leave yet. But let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.